Today on Media Litter Sandwich, we talk about... Dogs. PTSD, service dogs. Our special guest talks all about that and bringing a Malamute into a restaurant, you know, just walk in with a big dog. Why a not? Very big dog. Wow. Welcome to Media Litter Sandwich. I'm Toad from Toadin.com. With me is Will from... Allaboutwilliam.com. And, of course, Mark from CrazyMark.com. Now, today, well, we're trying to uh, do something a little bit different and a little not so different because we're talking to a guy who's going through and writing a book. And he has a lot of experience, at least some military experience in journalism, uh, joining us today with... Man, I'm just messing all up. He's working with service dogs, too, dude, (laughs) which is cool. Well, you are, are you? Yeah. Oh, I have wow. service dogs. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead and introduce yourself since I'm messing it all up. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Joaquin Watai. I'm the author of PTS Dog, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, and The Service Dog, which is uh, it's evolved since I began the project. But essentially, I want it to be the go to book for veterans who need help with PTSD, have tried everything else, and are considering using a service dog. And um, ultimately, my goal is instead of the service dog being the last resort, it's one of the first possibilities that we start to choose Um, because it's one of the most effective, in my opinion, um, one of the most effective treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. And it it uh, make it, it, it requires less drugs than the traditional treatments. Um, and uh, my friend uh, Travis Landchild, who writes the uh, Stick Vet comic, says that the PTSD service dog is the only treatment that actually treats the veteran. And when you break that down and you think about it, all the medical treatments treat symptoms. All the counseling treatments and stuff just attack symptoms. Well, what what makes that happen? What Whereas when you work with a service dog, when you go through the process of training a service dog and growing together as a team, you actually change. You actually grow. You actually progress and begin to to find some healing and peace. That's excellent. And I'll tell you what, you know, man's best friend, you know, say no more. But also, too, going back into Native American lore, when the Great Spirit put the being on first, on earth first, it was a man. And the second being to follow was a dog in Native American culture. So go figure. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The dog, the dog really has a connection with man that that is um, for many people almost visceral. Um, it's a connection that uh, is natural um, and happens very easily, and um, it can change the way you respond to the world around you by learning how to work with a dog. Um, and and one, you know, one of the things I stress in the book is that the team, the service dog and handler team is a very, very close relationship. Um, I, I oftentimes call my service dog my brother. Um, his right name on. is Skeeter. He's an Alaskan Malamute. And uh, I'm, I'm a weird case. I bred him. I've had him since the day he was born. And even weirder is I knew when I first held him, that he was going to be my service dog. There's nothing That's weird about that. Dog. That's I mean, it's 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 great. It's a great connection. That's what humans oh, should yeah. make with animals, you know. Yeah, it's it's a huge it's a huge thing. I mean, I had a his litter was ten. I had ten different puppies to choose from, and then his grandma had a litter two weeks later, and I could have chose from any of them. Hmm. But this little guy, he he was literally small enough. He fit in the palm of my hand. I knew it was love at first sight. We just clicked and connected and that's that's not the usual case it's a very unusual but um that's how it worked for me i mean that's not the usual breed either for a service animal is it no it's it's pretty unusual um i, I grew up in alaska uh, i i uh mushed dogs for a couple of years while i was in high school i worked uh we lived next door to a dog musher who had 40 some uh huskies and malamutes um, so I was really familiar with the breed. And um, one of the things I like the most about the Malamute is that they are extremely empathetic. 
they pick up on what's going on in you in your head very well. Um, but then the other the other part of it, and why I chose the Malamute to help as part of my treatment for PTSD, is that they are very independent. Some people call them stubborn. Um, they are very very smart, and uh, with PTSD, with some of the symptoms of post traumatic stress disorder, like panic, anxiety attacks, um, rage attacks. Uh, you need to have a dog that is able to look past whatever your your external symptoms are at the moment and 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 get past that and get through to you and the the personality of the malamute is very very strong and they're able to do that they're able to get through to you and and reach you and help you calm down and get you out of the situation that's cool Joaquin. That, yeah, that that's that's excellent. Um, I do want to talk about uh, um, yourself as a presenter, and you're also writing this book. So, mm -hmm. what makes you an authority on this? I live it. Um, I live it. Uh, I don't. I don't consider myself an authority. Okay. I am a service dog handler. I started with no understanding or knowledge of the ADA, and I started looking for resources, and there aren't any. I mean, you can go to the Americans with Disabilities uh, Act website and read the law. You can read a lot of the basics. Um, there's a there's a very useful document there. Frequently asked questions really wraps up the service dog uh, portion of the law very well. But um, seven years ago, when when I decided to try using a service dog, there just wasn't a whole lot of information out there, and you know, a lot of people. I, are still to this day are under the under the misconception that only serve only seeing eye dogs are service dogs and um and that's not the case so in doing all this digging you know i found well such and such dog trainers you know they train service dogs and you get little pieces of information here and there but you literally have to spend probably hundreds of hours researching to really learn about what a service dog is, what to train the service dog to do, how a service dog can help. And especially for veterans with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries, doing all that research is, this is a difficult thing. Um, it's hard to stay focused. It's hard to pay attention to, to all this data. It's hard to weed through what's real and what's not. So early on in, in my self-education on the subject, I decided that if it didn't say dot gov at the end of the rules to take it with a grain of salt and really filter it and look at it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been a pretty useful tool for me for weeding through what some organizations say are the rules for service dogs and what the law actually says. Yeah. And you have, especially in the dog world, you've got um, subsets of the, of the community who this is the only way you can do it. And if you do it any other way, you're wrong. And you're not real, and that's that kind of isolationism and uh, um, uh, agenda-driven um, information out there is really harmful to the disabled community as a whole, but especially to the veteran community. So I, I you know, what I said. People need to know the people need to know the truth about these things. People need to know the facts. Oh, gee, you know, I, I'm a journalist with almost 20 years of experience. Why not just start writing the book about it? And so that's what I did. Now, mm -hmm. I got a question for you here. You know, you're digging real deep with all these uh, bits of information. And according to one website, there's no real set standard for training and uh, classifying uh, service dogs throughout the United States, which makes it difficult to obtain certain license or passes or what have you. Are, are they any closer to finding a standardized uh, classification? Well, there, there is a standard. The standard is written in the law. And I'll read it to you uh, so that I don't misquote it. Um, service dogs must be trained, uh, individually trained to do work or perform tasks for an individual with a disability. And the task the dog performs must be directly related to the person's disability. That's, that's rule number one. Um, rule number two is 
the dog must be under the handler's control at all times, or if the dog is not under the handler's control, the handler must be taking the appropriate steps to regain control. And rule number three is the dog has to be thoroughly housebroken. Um, that's the standard. And anything, any rules above and beyond that, like I was just saying, is that's that's the agenda-driven stuff out there, that there are organizations who push. Um, you know, well, the dog has to do this, 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 and this, or it's not a service dog. That's simply not the case. Mm -hmm. And the reason the law is written this this way is because you're dealing with people who have disabilities, who have different levels of ability, who have different needs, and you can't nail down these 10 tasks are all a service dog can perform. And if they don't perform these 10 tasks, you can't do that because everybody's symptomology is different. Everybody's needs is different. Every dog is different. And if you if you made that list, what you'd be doing is prescribing robots, which dogs <laughs> are not. Yes, indeed. I hear yeah, that. it sounds like the research was kind of tough. Now you have some experience in uh, uh, researching things. Mm -hmm. I've been a journalist uh, since high school, um, back in the nineties. I graduated in nineteen ninety. <laughs> And then in college, I, I was uh, active journalism in, in the journalism program at my college. And uh, when I uh, ran out of financial aid and had to find a career for myself, um, I had two choices, journalism or music. And uh, uh, my dad asked me a really important question. He said, do you want your music to be your vocation or your avocation? Do you want to have to go practice every day because that's why you get paid? Or do you want to do it because you love it? So I chose journalism and I chose to become a Navy journalist. And I don't regret the choice in any way, shape or form. And I, I got to add uh, that the video version is different than the audio version. So you can see uh, the full veteran beard uh, because apparently it's a mark of, of, of veterans. Um, so one it might be a little more that, Santa Claus than mine, but looking like Grizzly Adams over there. <laughs> well, one of the things I, one of the one of the only things I didn't like about being in the service was having to shave every day. I yes, it. it was on occasionally painful, and uh, so yeah. Once I once I got out, I did grow the beard, and I spent some time. I spent a few years living at very high altitude in the mountains in Colorado, and it is kind of a, it's a mountain man beard. It it <laughs> kept me warm, and. Uh, um, yeah, when I joined, I joined right after high school, so my facial hair wasn't even growing in yet. So I was shaving it like I never know what a full beard is going to look like on me until after I'm out. I think that's why a lot of us have beards. Uh, the day that Toden shaved his beard, he vanished. He disappeared. It's like, who are you, you imposter? Oh, yeah. I shaved my beard uh, was like a year and a half ago. Yeah. And a fellow podcaster um, from Dave's Nerd Compendium started calling me Foden. Um <laughs> That, 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 that more than just them. Yeah, well, he, he brought it up, and then, like, other people from that network all started calling me Foden until I grew it back. Yeah, Misty yeah. was also calling you Foden. Oh, yeah, Foden, right. You know? Misty did, too. It's like, what did you do to the real Toden? Give him back. I, I think Gary from Monroe Comic Con was like, wait, so now you're Foden and not Toden anymore? And then they're like, yeah, he doesn't have a beard. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, Keen, <laughs> I have a quick question here for you. Okay, yeah. it's a little bit off to the side. Your mm -hmm. title, PTS Dog, has it ever been mistaken for the other PTS? Have you ever had any confusion with that title? What is the other PTS? The other PTS is uh, in kennels when, uh, or should I say, in uh, shelters when a dog has overstayed its stay at a shelter. They'll go along to the dogs mm -hmm. and put PTS no, you're the, the first uh, on the cages. And when I was yeah. looking this up online, I, I was looking up PTS dog, and there are quite a few sites that had to deal with hmm. PTS dog. In other words, hmm. y euthanasia. I'll be yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I. That's the first time anybody's ever made that connection, to my face at least. Um, because I saw online, I said okay. Well, but when you read it, PTSD are in caps, mm -hmm. and the dog is small so you see that it's the, it's an it's the acronym it is it is an acronym of the title of the book post-traumatic stress disorder and the service dog okay uh, 
So I, I, I would hope it doesn't read that way. I've never seen that connection made before. Yeah, because when I did the web search, I went, okay, wait a minute here. And I was clicking on a bunch of sites trying to get to the... Yeah. Now, did you put a space box. in there? <laughs> yes, I put a space yeah, in there. That, that, yeah, that, that, well, that extra, you know, that extra yeah. Googling does help avoid things like that. And, uh, you know, yeah. but it's easy to miss, too. Mm-hmm. But it is, yeah. It, it, For it, search it, engines. You know, you'd be amazed at the things like, oh, man, I didn't realize this comes up when I Google my name like mm-hmm. this. <laughs> now, on fa- okay, so you're doing a lot of things uh, promoting this book. Uh, one of the things was you were, um, now this probably, won't, this is not going to come out to Monday, and I think that your pre-orders for t-shirts are already finished, but you're raising yeah. money for the book. Can you tell us uh, yeah. what that, you know, what the money I, for the book need, is needed for? Well, what the money for the book uh, is for is, first of all, professional editing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've found a company that I'd like to use for line editing, which means that they go through line by line for continuity, clarity, correct English, um, and uh you know, the, the whole nine yards is going to cost me upwards of $1,500. Um, I, I'm a disabled veteran. I live on my disability and social security. That's Mm -hmm. an unattainable goal by myself. Um, so, uh, I've been working with dysfunctional veterans and, uh, they were gracious enough to help me by doing the pre-shirt, the t-shirt pre-orders on their website. Uh, but I'm also doing a GoFundMe. And if you give me a second, I can give you the link to that if I can find it. Do, um, do you remember what, what you know, GoFundMe.com slash and then it probably let's says. Publish, let's publish PTS Dog, I think. is Okay. And they could find yeah. that on your website or Facebook page, I yeah. assume. Let's dash publish dash PTS Dog. It is on my uh, Facebook page. I believe it's on my website, which is btsdog.co, uh, mm-hmm. because Go dot GoDaddy wanted to charge me an extra fifty bucks for dot com. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's it's on the PTS Dog Facebook page. Um, it's been shared on dysfunctional veterans and disgruntled vets and uh, decelerate your life and several of the other um, military Facebook pages on uh, and uh, uh, I. Th- think it's on the pin post on my Facebook page as well. Um, if not, it will be after we finish the interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, so this is kind of a full time job for you. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, handling a service dog is a full time do- job. Uh, and uh, so, you know, not only am I living it, but, but, but I'm writing about it. I've traveled cross country five times to get interviews and photos with other handlers. Um, I have, uh, like I said, done countless hours of research. Starting the Facebook page was great in a way because it gave me an audience. It gave me people to reach out to. It helped me connect with other veterans so that I could get those interviews. Um, but in another way, uh, I've, I've built a community in the, in the page in a, in a, and then a, a smaller group of PTS dog handlers who, uh, give each other advice and stuff and managing all of that is if I let it, it can be all consuming. Um, I've got a small uh, moderator team for the Facebook page so that I can step away from it and get the final touches done on the book. But um, it's, uh, I mean, this has been, this has been quite an adventure, um, especially the road trips. The road Mm -hmm. trips have been a lot of fun. Uh, There's been a lot of, uh, difficulty involved i got stuck in a blizzard in uh, cincinnati last year uh during my uh my second to last road trip that was kind of wild um i barely made it out of ohio <laughs> and uh yeah um, we, we we all had issues with making out oh, out yeah of barely ohio. get out of ohio that should even be when on a clear day. picture day i've had issues getting out of ohio yeah. <laughs> ohio doesn't want to get rid of anybody while you're out there working with the service dogs, what particular breed have you noticed to be perhaps, you know, the most popular amongst uh, vets? Well, it, there is no breed restriction. Any breed of dog can be a service dog, but not any, but not every dog can be a service dog. You've got to find a dog with a personality, a dog that's calm, is focused, is not easily distracted, um, 
and that, that it has empathy, especially for PTSD. You have to have an empathetic animal. Um, a dog who's just going to ignore you isn't going to work. The dog's got to be able to focus on you, pay attention to what's going on with you so that it can, can intervene and help you. Um, so an aloof animal uh, isn't necessarily uh, the right one. So you were and lucky to bond with a, a, a dog while it was a pup. And, and that's yeah. usually the ideal yeah. thing, you know, that's that's the bonding period. Right Absolutely there. it is. And, and that's one of the things that I've discovered in my research and in talking to all of these handlers is the most successful teams and most of the successful teams are the people who got their dogs very young or as puppies and worked either what I call cooperative training where they were responsible 24 seven for the care and feeding of the dog, but they worked with a trainer to train it or they self trained. And the, the, the key to a PTSD service dog building an effect, uh, an effective team is the bond that you create with your animal. And that bond, every single task the dog performs, every time it intervenes when you're losing your shit, um, is based on the fact that you bonded with your dog. See, the cool scientific fact with this is that a dog can actually smell the chemical changes in you and know Absolutely. exactly, I'm going to go get this guy's medicine, I can get his water to take that medicine, and I can take care of him and be there for him or her what, well, you know, till the, uh, the yeah, period's not, over. Not only that, but another scientific fact is that contact with dogs changes your brain chemistry. So there are a couple of tasks that, that my dog performs. Uh, um, one of the first things when I'm starting to have an episode is that he'll come over and he'll sit on my foot. So he'll put pressure on me and lean against me. I mean, he, is, he has to make close physical contact in order to do that. And what they've discovered, what I discovered is when a 100-pound dog sits on your foot, the first thing you do is drop your hand to his head and pet him. <laughs> and, and what... What medical doctors have discovered is that when you pet a dog, it releases cortisol, it lowers dopamine levels, and it causes you to begin to relax. So just the mere the mere act of him coming and sitting on my foot, which is his stage one warning, Dad, you're starting to lose control, I start calming down because of my natural reaction when he sits on my foot, which is to pet him. And... His the next step, if I'm still escalating, is he'll start pushing against me and pushing me away. Um, the last step, if I absolutely lose it, and he's only had to do this once, thank goodness, is he turned around, reared up, and he can look me straight in the eye. He's 100 pounds. He's a big dog. He looked me straight in the eye, put his paws on my shoulder, knocked me flat on my ass, and laid on me, which is laying on, on you is called deep pressure therapy. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of research into DPT. And he laid on me and held me down until I was calm enough to get up and remove myself from the situation. And yes. that instance actually happened at a Walmart was oh, wow. when I learned to trust my dog because I was always worried about, well, what's he doing? What's going on? What's, what's he doing? And that day was the day that I learned, you know what? He, he's got it. He knows what he's doing. Let him do his job and trust him. And from then on, I started learning to the early, I started listening to his earlier cues, you know, when he sit on my foot, lean against me, try to push me away from what was getting me spun up. Um, I started listening to him and he's never had to do that again. Now he's had to lay on me at other times when, you know, um, another thing it helps with deep pressure therapy helps with pain. And like I was telling you earlier, I broke my back while I was on active duty. Um, I do suffer from chronic pain, and when it's really bad, he won't leave my side. And most of the time, he's laying on me, which can help or or increase the <laughs> spending. But you know, his intention, you know, his intention is good. And you got to remember, he's a dog. So mm -hmm. if it's you know if it's hurting him, I move him a little, I get him to shift. But um, th that that bond, without that bond with my dog, he wouldn't know where I'm at, where my head's at. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know what his responses were. And because we, I, the way I term it is we grew together, uh, him from a puppy into a full mature dog and me from somebody who had no idea what was going on in my head and around me into 
somebody who I, I would hope if, if you knew me 10 years ago and you had a snapshot of me today, I would hope you would see as progressing and growing in spite of his disability. Um, it, uh, it, it just makes sense to be directly involved in your dog's training from a very young age. Right on. Um, now I've heard you talk about this, uh, other times, uh, you know, what are some of the reactions that people have when you walk into, let's say, a restaurant with your, you know, with your big, big, huge Malamute, which is your service animal? Yeah. I've had reactions. You know, the best reaction, mm -hmm. um, I went to a Mexican restaurant in uh, Utah in the Salt Lake City area, and they had never had a service dog in the restaurant before. And this place had been around for years. And the owner came out and he just simply didn't know what the rules were. And so at first he was like, well, what the we can now the, the outside tables weren't set up. It was February. We could put you guys outside. It was, you know, 70 degrees. It was a nice day. And, and I said, no, we don't need any special treatment. Just tell us where to sit. And in uh, Skeeter, part of what is one of his tasks is he blocks for me. He creates a physical barrier so that people don't get too close to me because that that, you know, close, close, close starts spinning mm -hmm. up the PTSD. So I said, just put us in an area where he can do his job and he's not blocking the aisle. And, and so, you know, they found us a nice corner of the restaurant. And and the, the owner came over and he said, you know, I've never had a service dog in here before. How do I know this is a service dog? And so I got the chance to to explain to him you know, the law, and uh, I gave him, I carry these little cards with the uh, Americans Disabilities Act information on service dogs on them mm -hmm. and the link to the ADA uh, website and everything. And so that was probably one of the, the coolest uh, reactions I got was, well, you know, I really need to know about this. I need to learn about this. Um, at that point in time, uh, it was a year, a little over a year ago. Uh, that area of Salt Lake City is was just beginning to get a growing veteran population. And so service dogs were becoming more frequent, but he'd never seen one in his restaurant before. Um, one of the worst uh, reactions I ever got was trying to check into a motel where I was absolutely refused, refused service. And they said, we don't care what the law is. You can't bring that dog here. And... Um, that ended up with a uh, with me calling corporate, explaining the situation, and the uh, manager slash owner of that branch of the motel uh, sending me a check, reimbursing me for the cost of the other motel I had to go stay at because he wouldn't let me in his establishment. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, corporate would have hired me to do some training for corporate in, in some form or fashion. And I'd like to get to that point where I do some consulting and ADA education, service dog education for companies, because honestly, most places don't know what the law is. And it leaves it to handlers who may or may not be able to handle that situation to teach them. Right. And, it, it, it's, it, it feels like kind of a conflict when the handler who, you know, who may – part of their issues could be dealing with people having to train people on how to handle the, their service animal, which is there to handle him because he can't handle people. It, yeah. It's a very it's, circular situation. Well, I'll tell you what, handling Skeeter cured me of my social isolation. I can't isolate myself from people when I walk into a restaurant or a store or a movie theater with a hundred pound Alaskan Malamute. And what I learned was, although I wouldn't give you the time of day before I started training him and using him, I can talk to you for hours about my dog. In fact, I <laughs> ran into a situation at a VA with a guy saying, hey, that's a Malamute. And, and I'm trying to check in and get to my appointment on time. <laughs> and this guy wants to keep talking Malamutes. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, yes, yes, yeah, yes, Malamutes, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I really have to go to my appointment, <laughs> you know. Um, it, but but it, it's it, – it can be a blessing and a curse to walk into a place with a dog. Unfortunately, although, you know, if you roll into a place in a wheelchair or, or using a walker or canes, um, nobody, nobody notices you. The service dog is the one piece of medical equipment that you can walk into anywhere with 
and it's going to draw attention no matter what because it's a dog and it doesn't belong there. And everybody and, likes dogs, so yeah, and everybody yeah. likes dogs. dogs are and, awesome. Oh wow, I was at a, I was at an office building doing some work, and uh, in comes a um, a veteran with a service dog, and uh, um, and everyone's like, oh hey, and they're sort of greeting him, but everyone wants to greet the dog. And as he walked away to his desk, I hear a girl goes, I love you, and she says the dog's name, like I love you, Skeeter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's a Adorable. Okay, I'm going back to work. <laughs> it could be frustrating for handlers um, because everybody loves dogs. Everybody wants to talk to the dog. Everybody wants to know about the dog. And we just want to get through our day. I walk into Walmart. If I was able to go shopping at Walmart without Skeeter, it might take me 20 minutes to get what I need. With Skeeter, that same 20 minutes in the middle of the day when there's you know a moderate crowd can take me more than an hour. Because you can't make it 20 feet without somebody to try and stop you and ask you about your dog. And some days I'm fine with that. And I put on the educator hat and I, and I you know, I try to, to share as much knowledge as I can quickly and, and, and politely. And some days I put those blinders on and get that veteran scowl and just mission first and, mm -hmm. and grind through and, and, um, it, you know, if it, that's the thing, if you're going to approach a service dog handler, you don't know why the dog's there and it's really none of your business. Mm -hmm. You don't know what that person needs the dog for or what the dog is or what the person's going through that day. So, you know, I would urge I would urge viewers to or listeners to think twice about approaching a service dog handler, because, you know, would you go up and talk to a person's wheelchair? Or yeah. their prosthetic limb. Absolutely, that's one reason why I, uh, uh, I again in and out of office buildings all the time, in uh, uh, in elevators, people constantly like, oh, you're going to be that one guy that takes uh, the elevator down one floor. Seriously, I don't know how many times I, you know, I look at the person, you know, after you know, the, you know, when they start complaining, when people do, it's like, look. They're wearing pants. They could have prosthetic leg. You don't know that. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know if that person is in a lot of pain right now. Even if they are going to the gym, they could be working on something different. Because um, one of the buildings has a gym in it. And we see people take it one floor as they're going to the gym. Yes, I think it's hysterical. But at the same time, I don't know what that person's going through. Let's not assume because we all know what assuming does yeah no i've also seen some dogs wearing like the the jackets that will sit they'll actually have the text on the side that says please don't bother me i'm working mm -hmm. with some mm -hmm. other service dogs so yeah service dogs are not required to wear vests uh i have found i i trained skeeter without a vest i trained him solely with a leash and collar i worked with him for five years uh at four and a half years with only a leash and collar I made the mistake of taking him to the National Cherry Festival in Traverse City, Michigan. And it was beyond ridiculous how many people, mm -hmm. thousands of people there, and probably 40 people stopped me to, to pet my dog without asking. And yeah. I just, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to try the vest thing, and maybe that will back that off some. And it is a 50-50... Uh, I'd say, well, let me say it's 70-30. 70 70% 70 of the people leave us alone because there's a vest, but 30 still come try to bother us. Um, some people put, now again, you know, uh, what I'm trying to do is teach people and educate people. So I put on my dog's vest, please ask to pet. But a lot of people put, you know, do not pet. And that's perfectly fine. It's up, it's, it's up to them. Um, again, would you pet somebody's wheelchair? Would you ask to talk to somebody's wheelchair? No, you would not. You don't know why the dog's there. You don't know if distracting the dog is going to cause its handler harm. A uh, perfect example, uh, and I can't remember the names, but there's a young lady who uses a wheelchair and a service dog to a sister who was in a grocery store. A lady insisted on talking to her dog, missed a seizure. The dog missed a seizure because she was distracted by the lady who wouldn't leave the dog alone. The young lady fell out of her wheelchair and ended up in the hospital. Um, so, you know, when you see a dog with a vest that says, do not pet, don't pet the dog, 
stay away, leave them alone. Um, if you see a dog that has a patch on it that says, please ask to pet, be polite, ask to pet. Um, they may, but you, again, don't know what kind of day that person's having. They may say sure, or they may say no. And there are days, even though his best says ask, ask to pet, there are days when I, I just can't deal with people and I say, I'm sorry, we're working. And I just keep going. But the other thing you have to remember if you're handling a service dog is that you're representing everybody else with a service dog. So if they have a really ugly experience with you, they're going to think all service dog handlers are jerks. It really works that way. When, you know, if they have a great experience with you, they're going to think all service dog handlers are really friendly. It works that way too. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't as a handler. Um, and that's why education of the public is so important. The more the public learns about service dogs, the easier it will become for handlers to make it through their day and just go out and live their life, which is why they have a service dog in the first place. Right. Yeah. Now, thank you for saying that because we're going to try and push that as much as possible over here to educate the public. Right. I mean, there's so many, you know, I, I remember uh, helping out this one lady, which, uh, she, you know, she was looking for a social media campaign. And she's like, oh, yeah, I make all sure all my dogs are service animals uh, because that way I could bring them into different places and gives, you know, gives a reason. And it it's very interesting to hear the stories of, well, this, you know, people wonder what this dog does. And I have to explain, well, well this dog is trained for this. This dog's trained for that. One of her dogs actually was uh, deaf and blind. And she was still able to train the dog to uh, um, at least be um, a support animal for uh, visiting uh, retirement homes or something like that. Therapy um, dog. A therapy dog. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know all the terms. Don't hit me. Um, <laughs> there, no, no. There are three terms. Okay. There's a service dog, which is individually, individually trained to perform tasks to assist a disabled person with their disability. Service dogs are protected. Uh, actually, service dog handlers have the protection of the Americans with Disabilities Act to bring their service dog with them everywhere they go with a, with a few exceptions like sterile environments, kitchens, things like that. There are therapy dogs. Therapy dogs are trained to go to places like hospitals or schools and visit with a lot of people. They are not protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, most places like hospitals or, or somewhere have to require some kind of training certification of a therapy dog, which is perfectly legal. There is no legal protection for therapy dogs like there is for service dogs. The third category is an emotional support animal. That is an animal, doesn't necessarily have to be a dog, that comforts its disabled owner, again, only disabled people, uh, by um, its mere presence. It could be their cat, it can be their duck, um, the only legal protection, the only laws that legally protect emotional support animals are the Fair Housing Act and the Air Carriers Access Act. Uh, emotional support animals are not protected by the ADA and do not have access uh, protection to places where dogs would not normally go. The ACAA allows emotional support animals on aircraft and the Fair Housing Act allows emotional support animals in housing that, that generally doesn't allow pets for disabled owners. And the thing you have to remember, therapy dogs, anybody can own a therapy dog. Ther service dogs and emotional support animals are for disabled people's benefit only. If you are faking having a service dog because you just want to take Fifi the Wonder Poodle with you everywhere you go, you're pretending you're disabled and that's insulting. Yeah, I, I've I've met some of those people. Uh, we know a lot of uh, YouTubers. I don't know about all of us, but I know you know I've met quite a few YouTubers and and other uh, uh, media personalities that uh, make sure they 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 buy a service vest offline so they could bring it with them to conventions and as a fashion. I've statement. met somebody like that. that yeah. That's yeah. that's uh, bogus. It absolutely is. <laughs> yep. you know. I've actually had to break up a fight between a disabled person with a with, with a service dog and somebody that just had a service dog but not disabled. Mm -hmm. 
Whoa. Well, it was at a convention. They wanted to bring their dog. Uh, and one of my friends, it, it, I wouldn't have, like, broke it up if it wasn't a friend of mine who ha- who was legitimately disabled with a service dog. It, right. William William, always getting into the middle of things. Joaquin, you're full <laughs> of fantastic information there. And for all you listeners and viewers out there in the Media Litter Sandwich audience, I hope you're taking notes because this is some fantastic stuff I didn't know about. And I love dogs. And where can people get a hold of you again? Uh, PTS Dog on Facebook. Um, I do have a, a website, ptsdog.co. I'm on the Twitter, uh, PTS Dog, at PTS Dog. Um, and I have an Instagram, which is PTS Dog underscore Skeeter. And you're very approachable. I, I see you constantly, you're constantly uh, responding to Facebook and. You know, very approachable. Uh, well, thank you. I do. I do my best to try to answer questions. Um, again, education is is the point, is the key. And and I'm not going to lie and say there aren't times where I just go, oh my god, how do you you know, this information is really easily available. But I got to mm-hmm. remember too, especially in the veterans of my audience, we're dealing with guys with traumatic brain injuries. Uh, you know, guys guys who've been blown up. So you might have to tell the same person the same information four or five times. And you've got to learn to, to have the patience to understand that you don't understand their circumstances, um, especially in a, in a disabled community. Uh, so, and that's taken a lot of time and taken a lot of work. And, you know, one of the benefits of training your dog yourself or, or, or with the help of the trainer, but you being there with the dog 24-7 is you learn that dogs don't respond to people snapping at them or yelling at them. You you have to develop patience mm-hmm. in order to be successful in training your animal, and that's one of those things. I you know I was talking about the dog healing the person. Um, it, you have to develop that ability, or you know your dog's not going to work for you. Yeah. I also want to go ahead and shout out your uh, YouTube channel because you do have oh. some great information on there. If you just search PTS Dog on uh, on YouTube, you will find. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe it's underneath. Uh, um, is it just your full name or is it just your first initial? Uh, if, if if they YouTube search PTS Dog or if they go to the website, I'm sure they could find it. I, links. You know, I originally started that YouTube channel a long time ago when mm-hmm. Skeeter was a baby. Um, and I had a, a little piece of flat, dusty ground in eastern Colorado, and I was building uh, kind of a homestead. And so I started that mm-hmm. channel initially to videos of some of the projects I was doing. And uh, those are gone now, but um, yeah. I, I've probably changed the name of that channel three times. What so state stay. are you in? Now I'm in North Carolina. But I've been. Okay. I've, the Navy took me from Alaska to, well, college. I grew up in Alaska, went to college in Oregon, went back to Alaska, joined the Navy, went to Florida after basic training in Great Lakes, Illinois, and mm. then uh, a school in uh, Maryland, first duty station in Florida, then across the country to Whidbey Island, Washington, then a little bit south to uh, Everett, Washington on the Abraham Lincoln, and then I ended up at NORAD and U.S. Northcom in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and uh, since I've been around a little, spent some time in Michigan, back in Oregon. Now I'm in North Carolina. Awesome. He's uh, running the roads there. <laughs> That's good, getting the word out. <laughs> Doing my best. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on today. And uh, with us was Mark from? CrazyMark.com. William from? AllAboutWilliam.com. And Toten from Toten.com. And if you're listening to us, you can find us the video on YouTube.com slash K, or just go to MediaLayerSandwich.com. Please rate, follow uh, whatever medium you're watching us on, and you can participate on Facebook inside of our Facebook group as well. Uh, you know, we love to share all sorts of different uh you know media and you could even self-promote and i totally welcome anyone to self-promote their media in there just be part of the community thank you for watching thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed our discussion and may the algorithms be in your favor. favor